going, everybody? Welcome to the Agents of Fandom podcast. We got a case file for you here today. I'm your host, TJ Zwarch, and I'm sitting down with the composer of the incredible ethereal score for Netflix's The Sandman, David Buckley. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. It's nice to nice to be here chatting with you. You as well. And so this is such a cool show, such a amazing score. We're all kind of hoping for the season two announcement every uh, every day now. And something <laughs> that was so interesting is every episode felt completely different from one another, down to the storytelling and the characters and the setting. Did that free you up to change things from episode to episode, or did you kind of stick to a main style, feeling like it would all blend together? Well, it, you, you said, did it free me up? I thought you were going to say, did that freak you out? Um, and in some <laughs> ways, <laughs> when, I, when I first came to the show and early conversations, before I'd actually even seen anything or read anything, any scripts, I was told that, you know, that this is going to be quite, we're going to move, we're going to move around. We're not just like getting into a setting and a groove and then running with it. We're, we're going to be moving, um, you know, quite dramatically from, from an, one environment to another. Um, and I think it did, it did initially sort of, I think in many ways it was the big puzzle to solve. It was how does one... Um, because the story has already been written, the script's been written, and you are going to go from a diner to a pub in London in the 12th century. And in the previous episode, you are going to be in hell. And then, you know, you this is that is set in stone. And so the question is, should the music be as completely making these big left turns all the time in exactly the same way as the story? And I think the answer was the music needs to acknowledge the environments and it needs to, you know, keep up with these incredibly um, uh, unique bits of storytelling. But at the same time, it had to have a thread. It had to have something that let people know this is the Sandman. Whether, wherever the Sandman may, may be, there had to be some kind of consistent musical drive. Otherwise, I think that the whole notion would have been that everything was too sexualized. It was like, oh, here we go. That's one thing. That's another thing. That's another thing. So I think my job was to sort of try and achieve perhaps the impossible, uh, but 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 to do those two things concurrently. One, say, yes, here we are, we're in hell. And Dream is having a you know a battle with, with Lucifer. But it is still our protagonist, it's still Dream. It's still the Dream that we met in episode one, and it's still the Dream that we'll meet in episode 11. And as you say, hopefully it's the Dream that we'll, we'll continue to get to know even better in season two. Yeah, God willing. <laughs> Fingers crossed. And that's mm. what I love about kind of this show and the community that has come along with it on social media is the cast and crew, all of the fans, like we're all rallying together, hoping for this season two on social media, because it really was such a incredible and unique show. And I'm very interested in what your process was like for it. Like did the, uh, how, how much earlier did the story and script come from when to when you began to actually start writing the music. And then in addition, I'm curious what your choices were specifically for episode five, because that episode was just so interesting and incredible and different. So, I mean, like, I mean, in many ways, the project, my approach was, was not dissimilar to anything else that I do in as much as I try and, begin the journey, my journey, which is, you know, I'm coming to a party pretty late here, the, everything, well, I can't remember if everything had been shot, but the bulk of stuff had been shot. Um, and some ed uh, some episodes had even been edited by the time I got started. So, I, the, you know, my first, um, when I entered the world, I, there were things for me to watch and look at. It wasn't just conversations. But I did think that part of my process needed to be, because it always is, if talking to creative people, showrunner, and just trying to get a kind of sense of what we want to do, um, what what we're trying to tell story-wise, and, and how we're trying to tell it, what we want people to feel, how we want people to engage with the show and all that stuff. And obviously this show, I didn't perhaps realise the enormity at the time of the fan base and the fact 
that there's, I knew there were comics and I'd read some of them, but I didn't realize there were these devoted people who have been waiting so long for this to come to life in, in, on the small screen or any, any screen. And, you know, there are lots of full starts along the way, I gather, over the last couple of decades of almost going to make a show, then they didn't make a show. So I think, I, and in a sense, I'm glad I didn't know how much um, uh, people were invested in this, because I think the waste of that may have been a bit kind of crushing. So I, I only really, that only really dawned on me when the show came out and I saw the reaction of fans, which I have to say from what, from certainly where I was sitting, and looking, it seemed largely positive. And it's like, God, you did this. You guys, you made something that we didn't think was possible. You brought this to life. And of course, it's the inevitable. Whenever you read any, whenever you're used to source material and then it gets made, some people are going to say, well, that character should have been this, that character should have been that. And you're you're going to, you're going to infuriate someone. I mean, that's, and you know, whatever, that's a whole different thing. But um but what I did know... As long as you're reading... infuriating the right people. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny to see the vitriol. <laughs> I mean, I think, I don't know, maybe, you know, when these comics were written, obviously, people couldn't just express themselves to the world at a push of a button. And now you can sit down, watch 10 minutes or something and say, why is this character black? When in my mind, it, or in the comic, it was white. It's like, Jesus, you know, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit tedious, frankly, that people, that people are so have that knee jerk reaction to, to, to just shout out the, you know, the nearest thing that might, might, you know, irk them in some way. Anyway, I didn't get involved in that along the way because I didn't, you know, a, I didn't perhaps realize how much of a deal this was for people. And B, that wasn't really my mission. My mission was to look at this knowing that it's a new thing. Yes. It's heavily drawn upon Neil's comics and Neil was, um, absolutely instrumental in the making of the television show, but we were doing so. You know, we were doing something new. We were taking this from a comic to to a visual medium, and in terms of you know, the, the wanting to try and bring something to it, trying to know where you know where do you start with something like this? That was obviously I'd stop asking myself that question and actually answer the question which was what what shall I do and I felt really I mean it's such an obvious point to make but because of the disparate nature of this you know where we're moving around from and where dream is whether he's in the dreaming or whether he's in the real world whether he's in prison a hundred years ago or whether we're in modern day London whatever it may be I felt if I could drill down on what the sound of dream was what his theme was what he sounded like then I thought I had a good chance of surviving and getting through this. Um, because he obviously is, even though, for example, we're, we're going to talk about episode five in a minute, and he's not actually that present within that episode. Um, he really just bookends it. Um, but the Sandman obviously needs to, I needed to find an identity for him. And that's really where my endeavours began. And it was, it was a, it wasn't a swift process. It wasn't like, oh, there we go. It was a, it was a it was a trial and error. It was thinking that I may have had something, and then perhaps even myself realizing, as as many people do, you know, you write something one evening, then you review it the next morning. You think, oh my god, what was I thinking? So I was sort of being critical and and trying to think, is this the one? Because if this all goes as everyone wants it to, there's a there's many stories to be told in this universe. Uh, and then, of course, I'd send it to the to the powers that be, the creatives, and they all had opinions, and Warner Brothers, and Netflix, and DC, you know, so there's a lot of um, people who needed to be satisfied. So that was my launching um, pad. It was, it was finding a, an identity for Dream. And then episode five is interesting because I think it shows in many ways the range that I was able to find within the score because I, in many ways, pulled back in episode five. I didn't need to do, I, I don't know how you might perceive, but I mean, to me, it's, I mean, it's, it's obviously embracing horror tropes in episode five, or well, not saying tropes, but we're, we're in a fairly horrific landscape here inside this diner. But I didn't need to, I wasn't trying to like write a saw score, you know, I wasn't trying to, or, or psycho, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to 
put a hat on a hat because the performances were so incredibly strong in that episode. So what I wanted to do and we felt was all working was I wanted to sort of do the less is more thing where it's it's more creepy because the music has just slightly receded into the background and it's just this little bed of unease and and it, almost by it being non-present and non in your face it, I, my hope was it would make help make you feel a little queasy and like god where's this going next where's this going next but i was never trying to push you i was i wanted the audience to really like feel themselves being just drawn in ever so slowly and ever so gradually apart from at the end where dream makes his big presence and there's these amazing scenes where he holds john in his hand and you suddenly feel then you feel the enormity and in in that episode you kind of feel everything i think you feel here we are in a diner which is normal this is not in itself a diner is a sort of average and commonplace as as you as you could imagine so it could have been in a library you know there's it's not really like that isn't the stuff of soundtracks but at the end when dream enters and he does what he needs to do to John, then I feel it takes on this more expansive cinematic kind of feel. And I think for me, that's what I love about The Sandman, that it just has this amazing journey, this of navigating from small intimate moments with characters where you're right up close with them to seeing the entire world, the entire universe. And I think it's just great. It's such a treat to be able to operate with such vast and complementary um dramatic vistas really 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 lovely to to work in this on this project like for those reasons it is such a mysterious and i th feel like ethereal is really the word i keep coming back to because the show and the score they blend so well together and you mentioned neil who was of course instrumental in the making of the show neil gaiman was of the uh, creator of the comic how closely did you get to uh work with him throughout this process it's funny you know the only actual exchange i had with with neil was after the show came out where we had a, a brief email exchange during the show itself i didn't uh converse with him directly but that's not but his voice was consistently present and relayed to me by uh, the showrunner alan heinberg so it's often the case in a situation like this, and I'm glad it was the case with this, that because there were the creator of the show and David Goyer and these various studios and comic book owners and all this stuff, it's it was a blessing for me that all their opinions, of which there were many, were funneled by Alan. And he and I would chat. We'd talk about it because we had to rationalise it all. Because if we... If we said, all right, Netflix wants this bit to be like this, and but Warner Brothers wants this bit to be like this, but don't forget that Neil wrote this in the original story, and this is a, it would, it would, if, I, if I'd be doing sort of 50 versions of everything to try and, and no one would know what to do, and it would just be a, a complete unfocused mess. So Alan was, was pivotal um, in distilling all this information and then discussing with me. And it, I never really felt like anything was an order. I never felt like, um, this is what it has to be. It was more like, I mean, you use the word, word ethereal and I definitely think there's, 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 there's moments of that, but I think more what I was going for was, was just emotional. I wanted things to feel not in a gushing, overly sentimental way, but I wanted us to feel, and I think, I think this was a, I think this is something that Alan encouraged me to do is like, let these characters feel real for people. Let when we're when we're in episode six, which is possibly my favourite episode, because um, such a after all the gnarly business in that diner in five, then we go to this whole thing with death, and and I, it's so, it's so beautiful. It's so it's such a lovely version of death, which is normally not you know associated with beauty, um, and. Alan just wanted me to write something that just had feelings and let and let the audience have feelings, but always knowing when to draw the line that, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, well, of course I, I did have violins there, but I didn't want to overplay them. You know, I wanted, I, I still want to, I wanted to keep some level of subtlety. I never, there's a few moments where the score goes full on big, but I never really wanted to always encourage or felt it right for the score to be like a, 
you know, balls to the wall. I mean, there's no action really in the in the in the in the plot in the, in the thing, which is sort of nice, refreshing to look at a show and it just doesn't really have to bother itself with action. It's more nuanced and intimate than that for a lot of the time. You're absolutely right, and you know, episode six was my favorite as well. It was such a unique portrayal of death, and as somebody who hasn't personally read uh, the Sandman comic, that I didn't know what was coming, and it was really refreshing and interesting and it had me captivated throughout the, the whole uh, season but that episode in particular was my favorite um, as you can see behind me here in my background I'm a big fan of the superhero stuff and similar to Neil this isn't your uh, first dive into it as well you've done the Batman Arkham games uh, you've done some work with uh, shows like The Gifted are you a fan of uh, of this stuff as well? Is this something you uh, seek out? Well, I think I'm, I think as a kid, like many, you know, I was born in 1976. So my first recollection of um, superhero stuff is, is sort of Superman, um, you know, the early movies. And I, I think I was... I think I was sort of semi obsessed with it. Well, I think maybe no more than any other kid. I think it was because it was so little to choose from back then. It wasn't, you know, now we, we are spoiled for choice. I mean, it's incredible when one looks. I mean, when I did the Batman Arkham game, it was the first time I really, really appreciated that these universes are massive. Um, and you could look at, I think there are probably characters I'd heard of as, as a kid and, and, Sort of thought, oh, they're just sort of side characters. They're they're incidental, but actually, there's whole stories now being told about about them. And I think what's great about the fact that there's so many characters is I think it's giving an opportunity to show so many more dimensions and so many more perspectives. It's not it's not just you can't. I think people who don't know might just say, oh, that's superhero stuff, and that'd be like watching a you know saying or oh, that drama stuff, or, or that war stuff. I mean, it's it's a massive and it's a complex, complex world where we have sensitive souls like the Sandman. We, then we got, you know, I, I don't know, and I can't, I'm not going to start talking about other, other characters I don't know enough about. Obviously, I got to know the Sandman pretty well <laughs> recently. But, um, you know, it, it is, we, it's quite clear that we have got, all these colorful characters with their own personalities. And I think basically it gives anyone who's working in the creative fields an opportunity to try and find one's own perspective on it all. It's not just like crash, crash, bang, wallop. Sure, there's some of that. There's some, there's some superheroes which are a little bit more, you know, old school and there's a place for that. But there's also incredibly diverse range for for for. for for these characters to express themselves and therefore for a composer, for an actor, whoever, to do something. So I, I yes, I I I I'm not gonna say that I'm a student of all this. I'm not gonna say that I've I don't have the instruments and in, you know that you have behind you. Um but I have learned to appreciate the fact that this is a rich these are a rich worlds which which are with 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 incredibly um unique and and characters worthy of exploration and i think that's you know I, I hope we can all keep on digging and find great new characters to bring to life on screen and um yeah and keep 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 trying to experiment with all this stuff how different are your creative processes from when you're doing a video game like batman arkham or a show like the Sandman or a movie like the 50 shades stuff. Like I'm curious as to how, like, do you have a template that it's like movie? This is where I start show. This is where I start video game. This is where I start. Or is it all dependent on the piece, the project? No, in, in fact, it's all, I do. I feel that what all, I feel the process really at the beginning is how, how do I get into this? How do I, navigate my way into something i mean i like to slightly look at any of this stuff let's maybe not video games so much because they're they're very different beasts because they're not um 
you know, just the way the story is unfolds is a lot more unpredictable. The player obviously has a lot of say in that. But I like I often look at a film or a television show that I'm scoring and I'm thinking I'm not supposed to my I'm, there isn't supposed to be music here. Like it's not normal. Like when you go to a shop or when you go to whatever happens in Fifty Shades of Grey, there isn't really music there. Um, so it's it's a sort of artificial. <laughs> I don't want to go into details, so. <laughs> but um, I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's so. I'm thinking, okay, if it's not supposed to be there, what the hell am I doing? And I do, and I think that finding one's way, di- finding a sort of in point, is the beginning part for anything. It's like okay, because when you establish it you've got to make it work throughout the entirety of what you're doing. Um, and I don't really think that's different from, from any of the different disciplines. I don't say, oh, television, therefore this, oh, movie, therefore that. I will, yes, I say the video game thing is a little bit different just because if I write for the Sandman, if I write, let's take an episode one, just to put, you know, I know that there's a journey within episode one of the Sandman. I also know that there's a journey within the season of the Sandman. And I know exactly how that's going to play out. There's nothing to debate there. You know, maybe a few editorial things happen along the way, but broadly speaking, I'm well aware of all that. And obviously in a video game, you can't structure things musically in quite the same way because just because you've seen a, a render of, of the game where it goes bomb, 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 that it could do that. It could well do something else. So that that's the only thing. But even then, it's the aesthetic that one starts with, I don't think is really different from, from anything else. It's it's simply, what am I going to bring? And I and I think you also have to ask yourself a very fundamental question. Am I going to replicate something that I can already see on screen? So am I going to look and say, oh, yes, there's those whatever. I'm going to do a musical version of that. Or is one almost going to conjure up a story in one's head where you're you're bringing something musically to it which doesn't actually exist on screen. It's actually a compliment. It's a, it's almost a character in its own right, um, and that's project dependent. It's not genre dependent. Sometimes you need to enhance what you're seeing visually, and sometimes your job is basically to to continue building that world. Sometimes you can take a completely left field and um, independent approach and bring and bring music in which almost feels like oh wow I wasn't expecting that to be there but somehow it fills it out it rounds it out it complements it all but th- these are these are decisions that you make not by genre in my experience but by individual project by individual episode even um and it's a you know it's a, a learning curve that forever I don't think one ever gets I don't think you I don't know I, I find it hard to imagine I would get to a point in my career saying oh right okay one of those I'll go I know what to do it's one of those I think it's always all oh, right how do I crack this one this is another one that needs figuring out the puzzle needs solving you've been in this industry now throughout Hollywood and video games for 15 plus years and your resume is absolutely incredible and I think after talking to you it makes so much sense too because not only are you an incredible composer but the way you view these shows and these movies i so holistically but at the same time can dive into the details i think that is what makes you such an incredible composer is there any kind of dream project that you haven't checked off the list yet that you are really hoping to get done in the future whether it's a certain ip or some independent uh anything like that wow you know it's it's funny because one's always well not one is always but when you're when you're working on something you know i'm right now i'm finishing off an episode of another tv show i do and i've and i've got a movie which is starts to finalize today so it's that difficult thing when you're when you're freelance that you're you've got to kind of get done what you've got to get done, but you also do need to have an eye on, on what happens next. And sometimes I take on a job because it's, I look at it and I think, oh, it's good people. And I quite like what they did here. Not, maybe it's not necessarily the perfect job, but I think there's, 
components to it which I find appealing. Um, and I can't say I've had a moment where I haven't, where I've just been able to sit down like with nothing on my plate and just say, right, what do I really want to do next? I just haven't had that moment. I've, I've often said to my agent, I'd really, I'd really like to have that opportunity. And he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, shut up, just keep working. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think, oh, I don't know. I mean, I can't really, I mean, I have to say the Sandman was a real, it felt like a first for me. I mean, you said that I've done the Narca, Arkham and I've helped out on Wonder Woman and that Marvel show, The Gifted. This felt like something very, very different. And I felt, I can't remember the last time I felt so, um, like normally when something comes out and you read the reviews, of course, because you're kind of susceptible to that stuff and, and or at least I am. And, um, but I've really felt sort of possessive about this one. I've really felt like it's it's sort of, well, there's multiple parents here. But I do feel like a little bit of ownership that this is something that I I, I sort of cherish. And that's why, I, you know, I think we're all on tenterhooks at the moment as to whether this has got further life. Um, so I'm not saying that there, I've done the Sandman, therefore I've, I've ticked all my boxes and everything's done. But it was... A, a real departure for me, I think, in terms of the type of project and I think the type of score that I, I got to do in the end. Um, I think, oh God, I don't really, I've always had an attitude that I don't really mind. As I, But I would favour jobs where I can collaborate with people. I, I'm not just sort of left to sort of take the, if, if things aren't working out, you know, I've got the ability to talk to them and they say, hey, come on, let's let's figure it out. Or, you know, not not just judging you on the first piece of music you send, which I've had, I have had, and it's not, it's not much fun, that sort of thing. And just jobs where you feel like you just, your shoulders can kind of, you know, they're not there, you're not like panicking. You just feel, ah, oh, okay, I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. That's that's ultimately, I think, all I, I crave. Something where I just feel this is, so not not about avoiding hard work, but it just feels like all the reasons that I like music, you like music, anyone likes music, all those reasons sort of come back to me and, and feel very palpable. Um, so I don't think I could say I've got to do a movie about um, this, this or this. Um, just movies where people working with nice, decent people, creative, intelligent, respectful people. That, that's I think that's all that would just be my requirement. I might be asking for quite a lot, <laughs> but um, uh, but I found it on the Sandman. I had it on the Sandman, so I, I'm I'm hopeful that that that, that yeah, you know, there's there's more of that out there. I'm sure there will be because you did such an incredible job. And you know, if you ever need extra collaborators, the agents of fandom are always here because this has been an incredible chat, and I am uh, so grateful you came on with us today. Uh, another thing I wanted to touch on quick before we get out of here, I'd be uh, doing a disservice to everyone listening if I didn't point out up at agentsoffandom.com right now. Uh, one of our new writers, Brandon Moore, just wrote out an, an incredible piece called uh, Racism in F Fandom and Examination. And just because we touched on that in this conversation, it reminded me of that. And it is truly uh, one of the most incredible <laughs> articles I've ever read in my life. So make sure you check that out. Neil, thank you so much for, uh, sorry, Neil, we're talking about Neil uh, Gaiman in the uh, conversation that <laughs> I don't uh, do anything. popped it's up fine. in my head. Uh, uh, Dave, thank you uh, so much for uh, sitting down with me today. This has been a blast. Before I let you go, where uh, can the people uh, find you on, uh, whether it be social media or if you have anything going on right now, or hey, yeah, just I... tell them to leave you the heck alone. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 because I just mentioned I was so... Um... <laughs> I was so kind of caught up in the Sandman and I, I, I joined after ignoring Twitter and all that stuff. I did join Twitter. Um, so I can be found on Twitter. I, don't, I, I need to get better at posting and I need to be able to remember what my, um, what my, uh, I'm just going to look here and see what my uh, thing is. The, the uh, what's it called? Oh, what's it called? The thing. Your the handle at, at Mr. David Buckley. That's my, that's my uh, thing. So I'll, I will endeavor to kind of, do posts and updates. I may have some something interesting concerning the Sandman to post 
not not about season renewal. That's way beyond my pay grade. But I may have something else to offer in the not too distant. So um, there we go. There's a little teaser. <laughs> A little tease, so make sure you uh, check out Dave on uh, Twitter. Check out the Agents of Fandom as well, and we will be uh, posting this interview all over our socials, on our YouTube, as well as uh, on the website. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dave, and make sure you check out The the Sandman on Netflix. Watch it. Tell your friends to watch it, and uh, talk about how much you love it on social media, because that's how we're going to get a season two, and it's such an incredible and unique project we definitely want to make that happen. So thank you so much for joining us today. That'll do it for this episode of uh, Agents of Fandom. Peace.